Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today, um, connecting in this virtual space with us here um, at St. Edwards University. This is the Friday in Focus webinar on forensic science and criminal justice. And we have two of our most esteemed faculty in those departments presenting to you today, Dr. Cassie Paris Fisher, who's chair of the Department of Forensic Science, and Dr. Michelle Richter, who's associate professor of criminal justice. Um, we're thrilled to have you today um, with us online. Uh, doctors uh, Fisher and Richter will be presenting for about 20 minutes, um, providing some uh, really good overview and, and highlights of the programs. And then we're happy to take your questions. Um, they look forward to kind of understanding what more you'd like to know about these programs. So as you have questions, please use the Q&A feature in your Zoom toolbar. We will not be using chat. So any questions that you have along the way, um, please add them to the Q&A. Our presenters will uh, address questions at the end of the formal part of the presentation, um, but that is where you can direct any questions that you may have. And we, we certainly look forward to um, answering for you any questions that you have so that you leave this webinar with a complete and full sense of the forensic science and criminal justice programs at St. Edwards and, and the opportunities that those um, present. I know this is probably not how many of you were planning to do your college search um, and you were probably hoping to be with us on campus today for this presentation. We certainly were hoping to be on campus as well. Um, but since mid-March, the university has been in remote operations, obviously given the situation with COVID-19. Um, and we remain so fully operating, but in a remote um, situation until the university deems that it's safe for our community to return. So we look forward to seeing you in person on the hilltop at some point but really appreciate uh, you taking the time to be online with us and, and learn about um, these programs um, in a virtual way with us today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Dr. Paris Fisher, who will begin the presentation and, and, um, and speak to you more about forensic science and uh, look forward to continuing on. Thank you for being here. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Forensic Science and Criminal Justice Program webinar. I am Dr. Casey Parrish Fisher. I am the chair of the, the Department of Forensic Science, and I'm going to start by going over um, the Forensic Science Program, just a little bit about the degree, some of the activities that our students participate in, and um, just a couple of unique things about the program as we go through. So next slide. while we're transitioning <laughs> to our slots. <laughs> One second here. Yeah, no problem. Gotta love technology, gotta love it. <laughs> so this slide is just a little bit about the Forensic Science Program. It is located in the School of Natural Sciences. So one distinct difference between criminal justice and forensic science. Forensic science is located in the School of Natural Sciences. Criminal justice is located in the School of Behavioral and Social Sciences. While we have a great partnership and work together a lot, the two degree programs are a little bit different. Um, forensic science mainly focuses on upper division science classes. It is a very, very heavy degree um, with upper division science classes. So we concentrate on math and physics biology, chemistry, as well as foundational skills in forensic science, like crime scene photography, crime scene investigations. Um, so it really is a full program whenever you come in for this. And the next slide will actually go through why, <laughs> why it is so regulated in such a heavy degree program here. So you can see here, we have a lot of governing bodies, a lot of things we have to really pay attention to when it comes to forensic science. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of all the TV shows that are out there, all the movies, documentaries, the Netflix series. Um, we watch some of those in class. They're great tools to help you learn and review cases with. But because of that, we are really heavily accredited, or not accredited, but we are monitored in what you have to take in order to be able to work in these disciplines as you move forward. So FEPAC accreditation is the first um, bullet point you'll see there on the list. So FEPAC is the Forensic Science Education Programs Accrediting Commission through the American Academy of Forensic Science. Whew, 
That's like a mouthful. <laughs> the, the longer, the better, right? Um, so FEPAC actually accredits university-based programs, and we are currently about two years out from applying for our accreditation through FEPAC. So that means that our courses are lined up, we meet the FEPAC requirements. It's just from the administrative perspective, we do have to gather data for a couple of more years before we're able to apply for accreditation. So within the next two years, we hope to have our accreditation on board um, and everything looks great for that to happen. The second thing is in the state of Texas, the Texas Forensic Science Commission oversees licensing of forensic scientists. So this is not something that happens in other states. Texas is really leading the way in licensing of forensic scientists. So if you really think about it, I mean, a food handler's license to serve food in a restaurant, you have to have a license. Um, to get your hair cut or done, that person has to have a license. And for forensic science in the state of Texas, that that's, there's no difference. You are gonna have to acquire a license to be able to work. So we meet the licensing requirements in the state of Texas. They mirror a lot of what the FEPAC requirements are. So it was not hard to meet um, the criteria for the commission and the licensing requirements for our students moving forward. And they've been really successful in being able to obtain jobs once they leave the university. Um, let's see what else to have on here. So medical school, PA school, nursing schools, and the forensic science program is in line with the requirements for that. You'll see I have a little star next to nursing school. We have a new program online with Baylor Nursing School. You may have to pick up a couple of additional courses for that specific program, but it's easy enough to be able to fit into your elective hours for you to be able to meet that requirement. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our coursework, something that sets us apart from other university programs, I think anyway, we do a lot of hands-on um, experiential based learning here. So your laboratory classes, you really get in and do some work. We are lucky enough to have Wild Basin as part of our university. Um, that is a place we can go off campus into a sort of remote area and we are able to actually go out into the woods to process some crime scenes. That's the pictures you see on the left. Um, in class, everything is hands on. We have alternate light sources, super glue fuming chambers, a lot of different um, techniques and processes that you get hands on or hands on experience doing through activities that are in class you will see that there is what looks like someone dumped upside down in a trash can <laughs> in the picture where it's orange. Um, we have recently incorporated some really neat elements into our crime scene courses, including 3D printing. So this is actually a 3D printing of a mock crime scene that we did. Um, we're also introducing virtual reality this semester. So you have an interactive experience in virtual reality um, in going through and processing a crime scene. So you will do hands-on, you still go out in the field and actually do that, but there's also a supporting element to that in the virtual world as well. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our students on campus. We are really active um, in homecoming. You will see the Forensic Student Association. We have won what's called the Topper Cup um, at homecoming for two years. The last two years we have come in second place by only a couple of points. So no doubt next year um, our team will be raring to go and trying to get that cup back. Um, it's a great group. We interact with, um, with people who are still out in the field working. We have guest speakers come into meetings. Again, they're very active on campus. This is a great way to get in your community service hours. Um, and it's just a really a lot of fun to be sort of part of this group. Um, you have all the same classes, you're in the same lab spaces. Um, so they're, they're a pretty tight knit group. Um, probably our capstone activity for the year is usually our murder mystery dinner. Those are so much fun. I don't know if you can see me in this picture or not. I may, I think I was actually taking the pictures in the one that I posted. Um, but everyone gets dressed up in costume. You become this character and then we have a murder mystery dinner. It's like a plated dinner and that's sort of our capstone. We would actually be doing that tomorrow if we were still in school um, as part of just our last sort of 
hurrah for the year. Uh, but the murder mystery dinners are a lot of fun and something that we look forward to every year. Next slide. People are always curious about what our graduates are doing, what you can do when you leave the university. Do you have to go to graduate school? Can you get a job immediately? What does it look like as far as an internship experience goes? Um, and we really have a really broad range of what students can do once they leave. You'll see on this slide, Caitlin Grant is at the very top. She graduated in 2013. She's been working for the Texas Department of Public Safety in their fingerprint unit since she left. Um, Sarah Cardenas and Louisa Bailey are both at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston, England doing their graduate work. Um, they decided to go out of the country based on a study abroad experience that they had here at the university. So that was, that's great. They, they're really loving it. I was actually on a conference call with them yesterday. Um, Amy Soto is at Sam Houston State University. She has decided that she wants to um, focus on toxicology. She's finishing up her dissertation and will be looking for jobs in the next couple of months. You will see we also have medical school acceptances. Most of them um, started about two years ago that I had like a wave of students who were really interested in medical school and being pathologists. And so in 17 or 2017, we had two students move forward to medical school. And then in 2018, um, we had an additional student, Christian Contreras, who decided to go to medical school as well. Uh, one particular note about Christian is that she is prior military. Um, the forensic science program is really friendly to military personnel and it's really adaptive. There are evening classes. It's easy to build your schedule around if you're interested in ROTC or any of those other programs. Um, it's a great program to sort of build your collegiate career around that. Um, so she is now in the West Indies just hanging out, going to medical school, um, helping the people in that region, which is fantastic. So that's kind of the forensic science program in a nutshell. Please, please, please submit your questions. I am so happy to answer them. This was just kind of a brief overview of what the program is and then some of the highlights in it. So I will pass it on to Dr. Richter now. Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle Richter from the Criminal Justice uh, Department. And the classes I teach are primarily in the criminological theory section, which you're gonna find. Um, we have a very dynamic uh, team that are teaching in the criminal justice program, um, as well as uh, faculty we bring in from the community, uh, specifically in the pre-law areas. So if you are thinking of going into law school or um, maybe becoming a police officer, uh, victim advocate, this is really a place where you can get a good law background. Um, you may also now get a really good concentration in law enforcement and the criminological theory. So you'll see our BA has a core requirement of about 48 hours, which is the major course. Um, that means everybody in the program takes those. And then, um, depending on your interests, place where you feel comfortable, you're doing well, you like your professors, you choose an area of concentration. As I said, it can be criminological theory, it can be pre-law, or it can be law enforcement. Um, now, minors are also available in all of these concentrations. So if you decide that maybe um, you would rather go into sociology, social work, or psychology, you can still take a minor with us in one of these concentration areas. So you're not limited. It's very open, uh, as I said, dynamic, and uh, you can tool it for the interests that you have. Um, next slide. Um, we have uh, been working in the last couple of years towards accreditation with the um, Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, which is the overseeing body for our discipline. Um, so what we're looking at is, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There is a minor in forensic science also. So uh, I got pinged by Dr. Parrish for sure. And she said, yes, remind you of that. So yes, if you wanna go into law enforcement, um, you can do a forensic science minor. If you wanna go into advocacy, you can do a forensic science minor. So anyways, 
so we have the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, um, of which I am a member. Um, it is a huge organization. And they have recently set up um, a uh, accreditation system where university programs uh, will have certain standards that they meet, as well as, uh, as Dr. Paris Fisher said, uh, data to support uh, students moving through in a quick program, making sure they meet the minimum requirements, they have a good formal body of knowledge. Uh, we're in the process of moving forward with that. Currently, um, it's just suspended temporarily. And then once that gets going, uh, we'll be able to, uh, I'm sure of it, obtain that accreditation. And there's a link there. I think if you all can click on that, that should open you up to the ACJS uh, certification page. We've also got um, faculty that are out in the community and they're doing active research. Um, in this particular case, uh, we have Dr. Karsten Anderson, and he did a podcast. His uh, one of his research areas he's been focusing on is um, panic defense and the features about it, if it's successful, some criticisms. And he completed a podcast and you can actually access that podcast and get to know some of your faculty before you even arrive. Dr. Lisa Holleran has just published a, um, a paper in a journal and uh, looking at, I think we're looking death penalty and jury cases. We don't have a link for that yet, but we will be talking about it in the future. And I am in the area of critical criminology and victim advocacy. And so I'm working on a couple of projects also. What's really great is our faculty, because we're working on so much research, we have the potential to welcome students to join us in doing research. And much like in forensic science, you can get a project and you can move forward with that and really develop and present it um, at the very least in the on-campus uh, venues. And sometimes if we feel that your work is strong enough, we'll get you to regional and national organizations and give you the opportunity to present there. Um, next slide. We have several scholarships available and honors that we do. Uh, probably the most, uh, uh, one nearest and dearest to our heart is the Randall Vetter Scholarship. He was an alumni, uh, graduated in 1994 with his criminal justice degree and went on to become a DPS trooper. Um, unfortunately, um, he was killed on duty. And as a result, his uh, family, uh, put a scholarship into play that will help pay for um, the expenses of the senior year, if I am correct. So um, you'll, you have the opportunity to be honored on the plaque, recognized during honors night, and, uh, and receive this scholarship. Now, two other scholarships that we have, and Forensic Science has it also, I am certain, um, at honors night, we recognize the outstanding graduating student in the particular fields. And so, for example, this year is uh, Enrique Resendez, and he is our criminology. Um, it's a program that we had that we have incorporated now into the criminal justice program. He's one of our last graduating seniors in honors, and um, we are just waiting to decide on the criminal justice honoree as well. So we take that very seriously. Uh, we know that you work very hard. Um, there is unfortunately no scholarship money for those ones, but it is an honor to be chosen number one amongst your peers. And um, we are this year writing letters and honoring them in special ways because we can't do honors night due to the circumstances. Next slide. We have a variety of student organizations depending on your area. So if you're thinking of about going to law school, uh, you may wanna look at Phi Alpha Delta. Currently, this uh, your faculty advisor is LaRue Woody. You're looking at a variety of experiences. In the past, they've uh, gone on tours of uh, law schools in the region. They've also had uh, alumni who have completed law school come back and do discussions. They're very active. And in the middle picture here you see on the screen, they've competed in mock trial competitions. 
Um, they've also um, expanded and in our curriculum, we have a mock trial class. So you can get some really good hands-on training from attorneys on how the trial process works, which is really nice. We have uh, Alpha Phi Sigma, that's the C National Criminal Justice Honor Society, uh, Epsilon, uh, pardon me, um, I'm Epsilon Kappa, but I'm getting all mixed up. It's, uh, <laughs> I know, you always go with your alumni group. Um, I'm drawing a blank. But anyways, uh, Alpha Phi Sigma uh, is under the umbrella of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. They're very heavily linked. And um, they've been around for about 75 years. We don't have, um, I'm gonna say, a large group for that anymore. Um, there are stringent, uh, uh, GPA requirements associated with it, but we do have candidates every year that do uh, get accepted. Now, the great thing about Alpha Phi Sigma, once you are in, um, there are scholarships, competitions, and a variety of things going on. Um, so again, you can become more immersed with um, the formal research and professional groups. The last one is the brand new one, and the chair advisor for this one is uh, uh, Dr. Lisa Holleran. It's Lambda Alpha Epsilon, the American Criminal Justice Association. And it, if you'll look to the, uh, the far left of your screen, um, they get very active. A lot of them are going into law enforcement. Um, and I, in that particular case, they were doing for homecoming a photo op booth uh, for all the associates and uh, alumni to have their picture taken. Uh, they're very active on campus. Um, it's a really good group. All the student uh, groups are really good groups. And if I go back to Alpha Phi Sigma on the very right, you'll see um, some students having a meeting um, over there. I think that is the last of our slides. Yes, um, here is how to contact us. You want to take a picture of this screen um, or screenshot it. Um, you have access to Dr. Parrish Fisher's email as well as mine. We may not physically be in our offices, but we're working remotely from home. And um, we check our emails a couple of times a day, Monday through Friday. And you can send us a quick message. And we'll, no question is too odd. I can say that. So having been a college student for years and doc, same for Dr. Perry Fisher, um, we can tell you about dorms, we can tell you about books, I can tell you about nightmares of organic chemistry, because I've done forensic science. Um, she can tell you about the horrors of DNA, um, just anything that you would be interested in. So I guess we'll open it up to Q&A. There's a couple of questions there. Um, oh, but awesome. I will um, let's see. Oh, Casey, this one is, oh, Dr. Parrish Fisher, sorry. This one is <laughs> No worries. It was it's bound to happen. I almost did it earlier. I know, you. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just want to throw in that, that that whole jail photo booth, it's nothing like throwing your, your favorite faculty member into jail for homecoming. It was great. So we do have questions. That's amazing. You guys keep putting your questions in. Um, I'll tackle the first one. What about becoming a crime scene investigator? And that's really a great question. So crime scene investigators right now are exempt from licensing. However, in conversations with the Texas Forensic Science Commission, the International Association for Identification, the IAI for short, um, does have a certification for crime scene based personnel and they have already been consulting with the forensic science commission about what licensing would look like for um, crime scene investigators right now usually even to be a crime scene investigator most job descriptions require you to have a forensic science or natural science degree to be able to complete that work um, the days of having an associate's degree or a high school diploma are really kind of gone at this point for, for that job line. So majoring in forensic science, it would cover the requirements. And then we're closely monitoring that as the commission continues to make decisions and update their requirements, then our degree program evolves and moves with that. So as a forensic science major, you would be eligible to work in crime scene once you leave. Now with that said, there is a difference in being a detective 
and being a crime scene investigator. So detectives don't physically go out and work the crime scenes per se. They're more on the investigative side of things, interviewing people, getting all the reports together, drawing conclusions based on what they are getting from the crime scene personnel. If you want to be a detective, that's more of the law enforcement track within the criminal justice program. So that's kind of the difference between the two. So commissioned police officer, you're more in a detective capacity where crime scene investigator, you're leaning more toward the science and actually working the crime scenes. So hopefully that answered your question. Do you want Let's me to see. start this next one kind of? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, now I know both forensic science and the criminal justice have talked about pending accreditations. Those are specialty accreditations. Mm -hmm. Both of our programs are already accredited under SACS, which is the university body. We meet the requirements to have a solid program. So we are technically already accredited. What we are looking for at this point is special accreditation within the governing bodies or overreaching bodies um, in our particular disciplines. So in this case, if you were to become a criminal justice student, you meet all the requirements. You can go to any graduate school as long as you meet the requirements. Um, what would happen is in this case, it'd be and ACJS accredited. And that would have that little extra punch for us in our area. Um, speak for forensic science. Um, it, it's the same, you know, Michelle is, or Dr. Richter was gonna happen. Um, is. It, she's absolutely right. And we're just looking to take our programs up a notch. Uh, the university is accredited. We have no problems with our students getting jobs, going to graduate schools, being really successful um, whenever they leave the university. We're just looking for that little bit of extra that we want to add on to our programs and being able to say that we're in line with these governing bodies for our professional disciplines is just like an extra nod to us that we are monitoring what's happening in our disciplines and we're conscious of what um, our students need whenever they leave. So our next question up, oh, what's the difference between a forensic science major and a forensic science minor? Um, so a minor is significantly less hours. So usually any minor that you're going to take at the university is anywhere from 18 to 24 hours, where a major is more along the lines of 70. While the minor gives you an insight into another discipline, it is not enough to qualify you for a job. So if you wanted to go to work in a forensic science field, just having a minor, you don't have enough of the science requirements to be able to move forward and, um, and, and move into a job. It would just be more of like an interest capacity. So if you're law enforcement, criminal justice, and you're thinking, okay, well, maybe I just want to understand these reports a little more. I don't actually want to do the work. I just kind of want to have a better understanding of things. Then sometimes they will add on the forensic science minor. Um, next up, next question. I'm only looking up because I have a second monitor that's above. So <laughs> sorry, sorry if my eyes look funny all of a sudden. Um, what kind of study abroad opportunities for this field do you guys offer? That is a fantastic question. Um, it is a common misconception for criminal justice and for forensic science that you cannot study abroad when you're in these majors. And Dr. Richter and I are here to tell you that that is 190% not true. I have a student going abroad in the fall still, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything goes well. I have had students study abroad in the past um, and you can absolutely go abroad in these programs. So we've been to England and Scotland. Um, there are also courses within the St. Ed's curriculum. A global perspective is definitely one of our general education platforms. And we think it's important for students to have a global understanding of, of the world around them. Um, so there are actually a number of courses that have a study abroad component that are tied to the classes. So you actually have an opportunity, even within the course of your regular coursework, um, to do sort of a study abroad experience, whether that's over spring break or over some kind of Christmas break, et cetera. Um, you, you absolutely can study abroad and we want you to. We want you to. <laughs> if I can add to that, um, one of the great opportunities when you come to our university, whether you're a transfer student or new student, 
um, you'll be working with uh, academic success and a group of advisors. Then in your second year, you actually come to an advisor within the discipline that you declare. So um, Dr. Parrish Fisher has forensic science advisees. I have criminal justice advisees. And we start that conversation early in, uh, in, this, in the sophomore year asking, do you think you might wanna study abroad? If so, let me know so that we can craft you a timetable about when you wanna go, where you wanna go and maximize the courses that you take there. Now, I will say this, sometimes you might not be able to get your upper level CJ classes depending on the university. But if we know, we can make sure that your global, your uh, basic uh, psychology for us, some of those classes, we can make sure that you get those classes. Um, in the past, I'm gonna say once about 12 years ago, I actually had a student doing a service component at a police department in Spain. She was a fluent Spanish speaker though, that was the key. And that was set up for her special with the um, international study abroad. So she was able to get that additional experience that others have not. Um, so yes, we start it early and we make sure that you're proceeding at a really good rate with your courses so that you're not stressed. You can go, relax, enjoy it, take the classes you need and have a wonderful time. So one more question that has popped up is what is the difference between forensic chemistry and the forensic science major? So that is also a really, really good question. There are a lot of programs on campus and sometimes they can seem a little bit confusing. So forensic chemistry is actually housed in the chemistry department and it is pretty much a chemistry degree with just sort of a sprinkling of forensics in it. So they don't take near as many forensic science courses um, as a forensic science major. Also in a forensic science major, it's a truly interdisciplinary major. You take biology, physics, chemistry, and depending on what your job focus is, we, or we, me, I'm, I'm your advisor at this point. <laughs> I direct you into the area and the courses that you need specifically for the jobs that you are wanting to get. So if you're toxicology, we lean a little more toward chemistry. If it's DNA analysis, you lean a a little bit more towards biology. If it's crime scene, I try to give you a nice even coding of all of your different STEM-based courses. So for a forensic chemistry major, it is solely chemistry. And then it's just, I think they take a crime scene class and in the introduction to forensic science class, and that's pretty much it. But so if you're looking to be chemistry focused and still have like a forensic context to it, then the forensic chemistry degree will definitely be for you. But if you're looking for a more interdisciplinary based study, then the, um, then the forensic science degree may be a better option. Uh, I, whoa, we got lots of them. Uh, let me start. No, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll take this one. Is there any other scholarship opportunities for this field? That's an, a very good question. Um, the better scholar is direct with us. The uh, financial admin, pardon me, financial aid office has a large database of scholarships. There are dean's scholarships, there are president scholarships, there are camp scholarships. There's a variety that come through the main university. Um, once you do get in, if you're over at least in the criminal justice area, psychology type area, um, there are, if you are working with a professor and you are doing research, there are um, some funding opportunities located there. Casey, are there any over your department? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we have a broad range of them from professional organizations to you know, things that, like you just mentioned, were specific to the university. And um, Diana, are you coming on to sort of address those for, for our yeah, webinar participants? Yes, absolutely. So uh, once again, my name is Dina Kennard. I'm in the admission office. Um, and every year we award general merit-based scholarships uh, to students who apply for admission. 
um, student, every student who applies for admission is automatically considered for those. So um, if you've already applied for admission, you probably found out in your acceptance letter, congratulations, by the way, on your acceptance, um, if you qualified for a merit-based scholarship, and if so, how much. Um, certainly, merit-based scholarships are just one half of the equation. We have a lot of students who qualify for additional grant money, grant being the same as a scholarship, free money that you don't have to pay back, by filing a FAFSA form and going through the process of being considered for need-based financial aid. So when you apply for admission to St. Edwards, um, and I know we have some juniors in the audience and even uh, some students who are sophomores in high school currently, as you um, enter into the application process, you'll automatically be considered for um, quite generous scholarships. This year, merit scholarships uh, ranged up to $24,000 per year with an additional scholarship opportunity for out-of-state students. And then for anyone who filed a FAFSA, even if a student did not have additional financial need, we were able to give them a little bit more, more money through the financial aid process through the Red Doors Scholarship, which is $2,000 additional dollars um, on top of the merit scholarships. But of course, many students and many families have financial need and will get um, even more assistance beyond that through the need-based process. So um, the university does a, a really good job of providing a lot of scholarship opportunities through just the general enrollment um, and application and enrollment process. Um, I know that there are some universities, especially large public universities, that tend to provide um, scholarship opportunities in individual departments or programs or schools within the university. Whereas at St. Edwards, um, while there might be some special scholarship opportunities as for returning students in specific areas, for the most part, students are uh, generously funded when they apply for admission um, and are accepted and, and apply for need-based aid. So um, any additional questions that you have regarding financial aid or if you are an admitted student who wants to better understand your financial aid package, please do connect with us in the admission office or in the financial aid office. Um, we are all working uh, and, and fully operating right now and happy to answer those questions for you. We also offer financial aid webinars twice a week and you can register for those on our website as well, um, stedwards.edu slash visit. We offer financial aid webinars on Tuesdays at noon and Wednesdays um, in the evening. So please do connect with us if you have questions about financial aid. All right, so thanks, Dinah. I appreciate you popping on and answering that. <laughs> um, so next question is about internship opportunities. Um, of, of course, there are tons of internship opportunities. Um, I'll, I'll pseudo answer for, for Michelle too and let her hop on and add extra, but um, criminal justice, they have internships formally with the attorney general's office. Um, they, we've had interns at the state capitol that have worked. Um, there have been, I'm sure she will go into the internships with victim services and things of that nature where we've been able to go in and, and work with um, people within the law enforcement agencies in that capacity. As far as forensic science goes, we have formal relationship with the Travis County Medical Examiner's Office. So we are allowed to have generally the summer is an exception, of course, um, one intern, well, actually two now we have two um, uh, agreements for two students to go in every summer um, and do an internship with the medical examiner's office. In the past, we've had students go to Travis County Sheriff's Office, the Austin Police Department, um, Bear County down close to San Antonio. I have students who have asked to go back to their hometown, so we've set up special arrangements for them to be able to do these internship-based opportunities back in their hometowns. Um, but there's really a lot of, I even had um, a student who, who knew this existed, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife um, had an internship where you could investigate sort of animal-based crimes. It was something she was really passionate about. Um, so she was actually able to apply for an internship there as well. So um, they're really all over the spectrum. And I think you will find that with just about any discipline here at the university, we have a broad range of internship opportunities that you can take advantage of. Michelle, you want to add anything? Um, I was going to say, you did a really good job of covering my ads. So <laughs> you even put the, the special and victim services in there. So you know, I love that. They're um, so important, though. They're so important. <laughs> uh, before I, I'll start on this next one. Um, I will say, uh, if you are not sure what you want to do, or you know you don't want to be a law enforcement officer, or you don't want to be a lawyer, and you still want to be in the criminal justice system, our job is to introduce you to a huge area with a lot of opportunities from working as data analysis, court clerks, 
paralegals, victim service advocates. I mean, you figure for every one police officer that's out, there's at least 10 civilian opportunities that are allowing that person to be out there or um, that are in the system that allow that. At St. Edwards, we don't have a large contingent that wants to go into the field of correctional services, but we do offer at least a discussion about that because TDCJ, Texas is one of the, the big three in terms of having the largest correctional systems. Um, so yeah, we can introduce you to a wide scope of job opportunities um, out there. And, and the, the next question is, is criminal justice a popular major at St. Edwards? I'm gonna say yes, absolutely without a doubt. We are one of the largest um, groups on campus. I think, um, what is it? Us, psych, and business, I think. And biology. Uh, biology. Biology and forensics is up there. We have about the same number oh, of majors as CJ. <laughs> and, and, communication, and communication, I will say too. Oh, and communication, <laughs> yeah. And, and the reason it is popular is because it is so diverse in nature. If you come in thinking you want to be an attorney and halfway through you find it's not for you, we can still find you a home without changing your major. It's very versatile. We have good faculty to help you. Um, we bring in guests. As we said, there's internship opportunities, but I always encourage volunteering opportunities um, that might not be available in some places, but um, we can help connect you with agencies um, because it's just as important to find out what you like or what you don't like, as well as what you like. And, and I think because of this hands-on, one-on-one, -on -one, you really get to know us, the things that we can offer. I think that's what makes our major one of the big ones. So I just wanna, if, if we'll take a final round of questions, if anybody has them, you might wanna hop on and type really quickly for us. <laughs> um, we, I just wanna add on, like during this time right now, we are in a very unique situation that we've, we've never experienced before. And I think for both of these programs, it's really important for us to tell you that in this major, in these programs, you are essential. You are essential. The, Law enforcement has been working nonstop. They didn't get a break. Crime still happens. You're the essential front lines. If you're going into the medical profession, if that is your background um, and medical school is in your target and forensics is kind of a backup plan, that's okay. Like medical personnel, they're essential. So these jobs right now, even when we see some of the economy around us starting to go down, these jobs are not going down. People are not being furloughed. They're not being laid off they are still working to serve us and protect us. So I think it's really important right now to, to think about that and look around at the different um, types of jobs that are really booming, even in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And these two majors are always going to be the backbone that supports a society, regardless of, of what we're going through. So in my, in my departing words for the, oh, we have, we have one more question coming in. Um, for incoming <laughs> freshmen, yeah. how would starting at SEU play out? I'm, I'm happy to Go kind ahead. of address that question, Cassie. Okay, um, good, good. So that's a, that's a great question, Derek, and, and thank you so much for asking that question. I know it's a question that a lot of students um, have mm -hmm. right now, um, both our, our current students as well as the students who are thinking about joining us in the fall. And so um, I, I don't have the answer for you at this point. Um, I think the university is uh, certainly um, planning for various scenarios this fall, depending on what the needs are. Um, to keep our community safe. And what I would say is um, there is going to be a webinar offered on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, the 28th of April, where university leadership, um, our vice president for enrollment management, our, our vice president for academic affairs, and our vice president for student affairs will um, all be presenting uh, together about what the university is planning for in the fall, what the fall potentially could look like at St. Edwards. So, um, more to come uh, in terms of answering your questions specifically, but if you want to um, begin to get some answers to that question, I would highly recommend that you register for that webinar. It's at 5.30 p.m. Central Time on Tuesday. You can find the registration link if you go to stedwards.edu slash visit and you scroll down to the specialty webinar section. It's called Planning for Our Future, um, an update from leadership at St. Edwards. Um, 
Orientation, there's a question about orientation and how will that uh, happen this summer. Normally, under, under kind of normal circumstances, um, orientation is a two-day in-person experience where students come to campus in either June, July, or August, depending on the session they register for and, um, and participate in a two-day orientation in person along with their, their family members if they wanna join them for a parent orientation that happens concurrent to student orientation. However, given the situation with COVID-19, um, we, like most universities, have had to move to an online orientation format. So orientation will be online. Orientation has actually already begun online for those students who've decided to be Hilltoppers in the fall. And, and students are um, beginning the first stage of online orientation by um, pursuing the Hill Start task in your My Hilltop account. Um, we are hoping to, depending again on the situation uh, nationally, we are hoping to be able to bring students to campus a little bit before the start of uh, classes in August um, to have essentially a second stage of orientation that will happen in person. So um, for now, the plan is to uh, get you registered for classes, get you prepared to begin classes in August through online mechanisms this summer. Um, but absolutely, as soon as we can get people to campus um, and begin in-person operations, uh, there will be a follow-up com component orientation that would be in person at a later date. So that's a great question. And I'm sure, again, that question will be addressed along with uh, questions about what housing might look like in the fall, classes, et cetera, by attending the webinar on the 28th. So I highly recommend that you or your parents or both register for that event um, to get more substantive answers to those questions. Um, if I could offer uh, back on your question, Derek, and for everybody else, right now we are not online classes. We are lecturing live as it happens. So we're in class, we're just not physically sitting in the same room. So it's not as if you are just reading stuff on a page. You are asking questions. We, are, we can do breakout groups. I had students doing presentations this morning. Um, it's just a different way of thinking. So I think just think live. Don't think canned ready to go. That's a really good point, Michelle, and thank you for, for bringing that up because um, I, I do think it's important for students to understand that, that our faculty have drawn a tremendous job of being able to very quickly shift and pivot to a remote instruction operation um, and that our faculty really pride themselves on delivering personalized, engaging, um, academic experiences in their classes, whether that's in person or in a remote situation through, through Zoom and, and online uh, mechanisms. So, so thank you for bringing that point up. Um, and thank you to, to both of you for all you've done to, um, to make those adjustments to our current students in your classes that, uh, that are going on right now. Um, we do have a class about, a question, I'm sorry, about um, will there be someone that can guide me with classes, uh, about which classes I should be taking as I go through online orientation? Um, again, another great question. Yes, there, um, every student who comes into St. Edwards has a success coach assigned to them. Um, the success coach is someone who is part academic advisor, someone who's going to help walk you through an understanding of, of the general education requirements, um, have a, begin the conversation to help understand what you're thinking about majoring in, um, what you might want to pursue. A lot of students who enter college are unsure of their major to some degree or to a, to a large degree, and your success coach is really there to help you um, go through the process of thinking about you know, what do I like to do? What are my passions? What am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? And what programs could be a fit for that? So um, everyone has a success coach assigned to them, whether they are a new freshman or a new transfer student to St. Edwards. And yes, students will be meeting and, and connecting with their success coaches um, during this online orientation format, um, albeit it might not be in person for a while, um, but they will be connecting uh, in a very personalized way with their success coach to understand what classes they need to take and how they need to structure um, classes around maybe other obligations they, that they might have for the fall. So of course, you know, some students work part-time, some students are involved in athletics or other 
um, campus activities that require them to structure their classes a certain way. So your success coach works with you to make sure that you get a schedule that meets your needs. Cassie, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, if I could just add to that really quickly. Um, I think it's important to know that when you come to St. Ed's, it's a small community. You are not a number in a classroom. Um, Dr. Richter and I both have good working relationships with all the success coaches in our academic counseling center. We are in constant communication with them. Um, if you go in and have a question that they may not know specific answer to, they will immediately pick up the phone or text us or call us and say, hey, you know, so-and-so's in my office. Um, we have a question for you. And then we will address that question. So um, anyone, any major that you're in, you are really, really connected to the community here. It's like no, no person is left behind. Um, your success coaches are there to help you be successful. Your faculty members are there supporting them and making sure that we give you the best information possible. So it's really a, a, a very personalized experience when you come here. You're not a number. People are going to know your name. They're going to see you walk around campus. Um, and I think that's comforting. It's a, a little more like family than it is a, a business or something like that. So just know that when you meet with your success coaches, you know, embrace that relationship. We have relationships with them and we just, we all want you to be successful. So that's, uh, that's kind of the point of those. So that was all. No, excellent. Great points. Thank you for, for contributing those. Um, so we have a question about a uh, work study and whether we offer work study at the university. And I just wanted to address that. Um, yes, we do offer work study. Students can get jobs on campus whether they're offered work study or not. Uh, but of course, it's always nice to uh, have work study if you qualify because it just provides um, more opportunities uh, to, to apply for on campus jobs. There are some jobs that are restricted to work, camp work study students only and some that are open to either. Um, if you have not been offered work study in your financial aid package, I would highly recommend that you connect with your uh, student financial services advisor. You can find their information on our website if you don't know who that person is. You can also contact the admission office, uh, seu.admit at stedwards.edu, and we'll connect you with your financial aid counselor. Um, but you should absolutely ask your financial aid counselor if you qualify for work study, and if so, um, if that can be something that, that is available to you. Um, so again, sometimes it is, is offered automatically in your package. Sometimes you need to engage in a conversation with your financial aid advisor to find out if you qualify for it and, and can receive it. But even if you don't receive work study, you absolutely can get a job on campus um, regardless. So, uh, and certainly, you know, being that we are in the middle of Austin, we are uh, really in the epicenter of uh, the main commercial activity in Austin. There are plenty of pace, places that our students get jobs off campus um, that are within, you know, walking distance or a short uh, bike ride away from campus. Coffee shops, retail shops, restaurants, um, any number of places. Um, so, yes, absolutely, to answer that question. Um, there is a question. How many people is there on an, in an average classroom? Um, I will let Casey uh, Parrish Fisher talk about hers. Mine can range anywhere right now from 12 to 26. I teach 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 level classes. Um, usually my bigger classes are freshman and uh, sophomore where we're looking about 25-ish. Um, then when I start to get in, third, in your junior year, and your senior year, um, that's when we start to get people really concentrating in their tracks, going down their career paths. And so it's not uncommon for me to have 15, 16 in those classes. Um, what about in forensic science? So ours are about the same. We run um, on average 20 to 25 students in the freshman, sophomore level courses because they are more general based courses. And then as they proceed into junior and senior year, um, they get to 10 to 15 students per class. So um, really important that, you know, we have small classes for us. Again, they're even in our general like biology classes and chemistry classes. I went to a larger university for my undergrad and my general biology class had 470 people in it. And then we broke out for our labs of about 30 people. Um, there, there is none of that here. Um, even in some of our more general classes, 20 to 30 students is about max for what you were going to see in any of the courses that we have here. 
So you, sh you shouldn't fear that you're going to be stuck in like a massive lecture hall and, and not, um, not be seen. You, you will be seen and you will be missed if you're not in class. <laughs> all right. So I think we are all done with our questions. I'm just checking up to make sure. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so I just, I'll do a little bit of a closing statement just really quickly. I want to thank you all so much for coming on and listening to us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure. I'm sorry it's not in person. I, for one, am itching to get back to the hilltop. I miss my lab. I miss being in lab with my students. I have research students right now that we are doing um, remote-based research, which is really interesting. Um, but I want to thank you all so much again for, for being interested in our programs and popping on today. And we really hope to see you um, on the hilltop in the fall. So Dr. Richter, I will pass it to you. <laughs> thank you uh, so much for coming out. Uh, this was really a joy. You don't know how much I miss actually being in the office and around people. So uh, if I stutter a lot, it's because I'm so excited to meet new people. <laughs> But please do not hesitate to email either of us if you have questions. We will send them to the people that they need to go to if we don't have the answers. And I look forward to meeting you all in the fall. Thank you everyone for attending today. We hope to see you in person on the Hilltop very soon. Thank you again and please don't hesitate to follow up with us as we can be of assistance in the admission office or on the faculty side. Thank you. Bye, everyone.